start. I'll do the pyramid, then back to you, and then back to you. Okay. We're getting better and better. Hi, how are you? Oh, we're so much. <laughs> I know. a few other letters behind me. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. We have um, quite a number of participants online, so hoping to make this as interactive hybrid event as possible, but we're very excited to introduce our guest speakers. They're gonna be talking about um, case studies actually for innovative models for patient and community engagement perspectives in research. Um, I'm very honored to announce our guest speakers who you'll hear from shortly. Um, but we have um, Heidi Boynton, who's here from Jacob's Heart. She's the executive director there. Um, we also have um, Stephanie Smith, who's an assistant professor in hematology oncology. We also have um, Juno Olbaden um, Malaver, who is an associate professor in the department of um, OBGYN. Daniel Moretti, who's the community engagement lead for PrideNet. And also um, Diana Tordoff, um, who is a postdoctoral scholar here also working with PrideNet. So we're very excited to have them um, really present on these innovative models of community engaged research. We also have um, several experts in the room I know in this topic area as well, hoping to engage them also. Um, so before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping slides for upcoming events. Um, so we have, um, actually, are the housekeeping slides? They're usually in here, but, well, I, I will just tell you, since they're not in there, that usually we like to thank the education committee for all of their support of all of these events and their programming. And there also will be an event to look out for, um, in upcoming months, we have a couple of seminars on qualitative research. In the um, summer, I think we're gonna have another event focused on um, how you develop community advisory boards with some examples from scholars who are doing this work. And you may hear about that today as well. Um, and then we will also be having um, an event with the Clinical Research Support Office, um, which is a research event over the summer for those of you who are doing research in clinical um, hospital settings. Um, anything else, Dame, that um, we should bring up before getting started? I, I just mentioned it, so. Okay, perfect, great. So we're gonna go ahead and get started then. I am welcoming first speakers, um, Stephanie Smith and um, Heidi Boynton, who are here today. Thank you. So thank you so much. And this is the clicker. I'm gonna give that to her, you she's the expert. Your, um, yep, we got those things. Um, so hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about our context together. Um, if any conversation about this partnership needs to start with discussing an institution. Um, those of you who might be listening from hematology and oncology are likely already very familiar with the organization. Um, but those who, who may not take care of kids with cancer may not know anything about it. Um, so Jacob's Heart is a cancer support organization that's based in Watsonville and serves the Salinas Valley and many surrounding communities, um, a four county area in Santa Cruz County, Monterey County, San Diego County. Boston and Clara County that really provides comprehensive support and services to all kids um, and their families, uh, all kids who are diagnosed with cancer up to the age of 20. Um, and that's longitudinal support that's really multifaceted. The organization has been around for 25, now 26 years, um, and it's really grown organically since its founding. Um, and I'll let Heidi tell us a little bit about what Jacob's Heart is. Great. Thanks, Steph. Good to see everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, Jacob's Heart has been around for 26 years, and the founding principle was to ask the question to families whose focus is their child who's been diagnosed, um, how can we step in where others can't? Um, we're not the hospital, we're not a nurse, we're not necessarily social workers in the clinical setting, we are in your neighborhood, um, and what can we do to ease the burden a bit for what you are facing? And we define family as defined by the family itself, which um, is a way that we can really honor and respect a family's journey and what they look like in their makeup and what their needs are. So if we can start there, we can build trust with them and open the door for them to ask for help that might mitigate some of the typical um, ways that families get isolated when facing a crisis like this. 
Um, we use an, an ad adapted version of Maslow's work um, to look at how we can step in immediately. So of course, um, we know that we can talk to them a little bit easier, look for ways that we can support if we address the basic human needs. And for us, that looks like um, transportation to and from treatment. Many of our families, as Stephanie mentioned, live in Salinas Valley and transportation is a huge hurdle. Um, even in our second year of operation, a child died unnecessarily from a cancer diagnosis that's totally treatable because of lack of transportation to the hospital. The closest hospital for treatment is here. Um, so if you live in King City, which is a 250 mile round trip and you don't have reliable transportation or you're staying with family members that um, have one car and somebody has to work, the likelihood of making it to your appointment is quite low. And so we have a um, one driver, one car to one family transportation program. That means our drivers pick families up at their home, take them to their appointment, wait here all day around the hospital area until they're done and then bring that home family home while stopping also to get a meal to make sure that family's fed at the end of the day. Um, this relieves a lot of, of frustration, stress, um, the trauma that families are dealing with when they're at the hospital all day. Maybe they got some really bad news. Maybe the treatment happened to be particularly tough. They can sit in the, in the safe car, quiet car, just themselves. They know that our drivers know them well, know what they're going through and are able to um, help them and hold space for them as they, they go through that. We also um, deliver groceries every week to our families. While we are not solving food insecurity, we are easing a burden for our families and our, fam our grocery program is designed much like Instacart. Uh, we, we follow a model where our families teach us and we don't make up programs just to make up programs. We ask the families what they need and we try to do the best that we can to adapt what we're doing to meet their need or we find others who can do that. And for us, groceries is a great tether to our families um, they know that we're here, they know we're committed to them. And so they're able to order what they need every week through our program and it ebbs and flows and really works with the dynamic state that our families are constantly in so that they can get the food that they need for the family members that are at home. We offer direct financial assistance, we have housing assistance. And from there, we live in this sort of tunnel and circle of, of all of these things, which is ultimately helping families um, keep guiding towards hope and healing through Counseling, we have an in-house clinic um, with licensed clinicians delivering therapy to all family members. As I mentioned, that could be a, a cousin, an older sibling that's taking care of the kids, anyone whose family is um, eligible for one-on-one -on -one counseling, family counseling. Um, we have support groups, treatment, um, in-treatment support group, remission support group, and bereaved support group. We have camp for our families that are in treatment or in remission every summer and then coming up in about a month, we have our bereaved camp um, because for us it's important that uh, once a Jacob's Heart family, always a Jacob's Heart family. So we ensure families who are bereaved are able to be a part of Jacob's Heart family as long as they need. Um, I could go on and on, but. <laughs> um, so with that, with that whirlwind to our a Jacob's Heart family, a little bit about the group research together. Um, and this research really starts from the foundation of community partnerships first. Um, and then together joint needs assessments, um, which really has been in the form of qualitative research and hearing the words of, of the families um, and the, the folks involved in their care directly, um, with the goal of not just describing the problems, but focusing on interventions and how we can start to make changes together um, to actively improve. So one of the issues that, um, that I focused a lot on is the idea that once a child is diagnosed with cancer, unfortunately their journey is not over with the end of their treatment, um, but actually, for those who survive, and the survival rates are about 85% of all kids diagnosed with cancer today will become long-term survivors, we know that they face lifelong health risks, which means that their treatment history, their cancer history needs to follow them throughout their lives um, so that they can receive recommended lifelong care. We know that nationally, less than 20% of long-term survivors receive the recommended care. And we also know that unfortunately, these rates are much lower in populations that face higher social risks, whether these are um, issues like food insecurity, housing insecurity, low-income households, um, rural areas without access to transportation or, or medical centers generally, and folks for whom um, preventative health care, like perhaps early colon cancer screening or early breast cancer screening, is lowest on their list of 100 priorities. It, it didn't even make the list, um, rightfully so. And so the question is, um, knowing that social determinants are linked with suboptimal survivorship care, what can we do in our local areas? Um, and so this really focuses on the Salinas Valley area, 
which we know has low area socioeconomic status, predominantly Hispanic, Latino, um, Latino Hispanic family, um, and high rates of non English language learners with um, populations within the population primarily speaking English and many speaking dialects. So, this is a, just an overview. Um, yep, adding another microphone. Um, this is just an overview of our, our sort of partnership and research over time. Um, starting in 2021 was really our, uh, the beginning of when we met together for the first time. And Heidi will tell you a little bit about the origin of that story in a couple of minutes um, with our first grant application that was a pilot grant funded by the MCHRI. Um, since then, we proceeded with needs assessment interviews in 2022 to 2023. Um, and then that's really been the foundation of a lot of our work that has branched from that initial, initial foundational qualitative work um, to understand what are different areas that we can dive deeper into, what are areas that we could tackle um, either as a community organization in terms of increasing support for long-term survivors um, or as a and or as a research partnership areas that we need to do more research in before we develop programs and interventions. Um, most recently, we've been focusing on language and communication for Hispanic Latino families. Um, and really, the goal of all of this work together um, is to develop collaborative interventions that bridge the clinic setting and the community setting to try to mimic some of this wraparound support that our community-based organizations deliver um, and to think, um, think specifically about the needs of long-term childhood cancer survivors. And with that, I will turn it over to Heidi to tell um, us a little bit about how it all got started. Um, so it was very serendipitous in a lot of ways. Um, we had had a board retreat in the summer and at that board retreat, one of our board members whose son is now 26, um, was starting to really struggle with adulthood, young adulthood. And this mom, um, with her heart breaking was asking the question of me, what are we doing at Jacob's Heart to support families? We're, as, as we mentioned, we're 26 years old. So we're now at the place where a lot of our early kids are adults, young adults. And many of them are well supported. They have family and community that is helping shepherd them into life. And then there are some that are not, they don't have that kind of network. And so when this mom shared her heartbreak with me, I didn't know, and actually um, a colleague of, of y'all's, uh, Barbara Sorks was there, she's on our board, and she said, well, there's actually a survivorship program up at LPCH, let's get him connected to that. Oh, great, and I had no idea that this existed. And so we were doing our own research, and this mom said, well, there's no way I'm gonna get my kid who lives in Santa Cruz to drive up to Palo Alto for a support group. It's just not gonna happen. I can't get him to go even to San Jose for anything. And so I just didn't really know quite what to do with it. I was very new to my role at Jacob's Heart. And not long after, um, I got an email from Amal and Steph. Um, and for us, what worked so well is there was a serendipity of the timing because it was a conversation around survivorship. And here I was having this ongoing conversation with this mom and looking around saying, okay, we have a tagline that says, once a Jacob's Heart family, always a Jacob's Heart family, are we telling the truth? And if we're not, then we need to get our act together. And so this was all really great timing from, from my perspective as a leader of the organization to make sure that we were actually doing what we said we were doing. But the only reason that it worked was because of the relationship that existed and the, the willingness of, of Stephanie and her team at the time to get to know Jacob's Heart on a really deep level. Amal had worked with our team, Mary Smith, who's our Director of Family Services and Programs. They'd worked very closely together for years when Amal was a social worker on the, the Hemon floor, she knew our family, she knew Mary, she knew our team. And so we said yes to the dress because we knew Amal and we respected her. And so we said, okay, yeah, let's have a meeting and let's talk this through. So for, for us there, we had a lot of really great things happening um, to build a research partnership from the beginning because there was already a, a great deal of trust. So that's how it got started. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So having that, just to, to um, sort of echo that a little bit more and emphasize, Amal Tier was a social worker here for about five years um, and worked closely with Jacob's Heart in that time. And I worked closely with Amal clinically. Um, and so when, when I was uh, kind of sitting, this is toward the end of the summer of 2021, trying to understand how can we start to tackle some of the issues facing our, um, our start to tackle understanding even and delineating what the issues facing our long-term survivors in the Salinas Valley um, 
I talked to Enmal and said, what do you think about, um, about Jacob's heart? I know them clinically. I know so many of our families rely on their support and services. Is there anything that, that we could think of together um, that might be a way to reach some of these families and understand the, the context and understand what Jacob's heart may already be doing to yeah. support long-term survivors? And so that was really the beginning. Um, and Mal connected us by email. And then um, thankfully, you guys took the call because you knew her. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that first meeting was really just from my perspective, I went in with like very low, um, like no particular agenda, except to understand what was going on and, and to introduce myself as someone who um, cared and asking these questions together. Yeah, I, I think you're touching on something really important and knowing that this conversation is learning best practices on how to work in relationship. The, the fact that Amal already had that relationship with Jacob's heart and that, that's not always the case. I know that we were really fortunate to have that. But Steph and I were just briefly talking before this started. I, I get emails often, which is amazing because it means there's a lot of curious minds out there and there's people that, that have real deep passion to help solve problems. But when I get an email asking for me to send information or recruit families to go be a part of, of a research study, those get deleted because I don't know you, you don't know me and you don't know my programming. And I will sing Stephanie's praises all day long. And some of those come from the, the respect that she has had for Jacob's Heart, not only our staff um, and myself personally as the executive director, she leans into what I know and what I continue to learn every day. And I feel a great deal of respect in, in that way. And then also really respects our team and the time that the team is giving towards us. And then respects our families and understands that stepping into their lives at a time for most of them, regardless of how long their child's been in remission, there is, is a lot of, of chaos from like a heart space. There's a lot of, of charged memories, um, a lot of disassociation from the word cancer and the hospital. People don't even like the color red because of their experiences being up at, at LPCH. And so there's a, a great deal of respect for that. And then inside all of that was a willingness, you said it very well, to learn what we were doing and not thrust something on us that, mean that meant that we needed to create something new or step outside of the work that we're already doing. A, a sort of long, like across the board problem for nonprofits and community-based organizations that are deeply invested in their community is mission creep. We, we, somebody says, you know, here's this thing, I'm gonna put this carrot out here and I'm gonna let you chase it. And we're scrambling all the time to make the pennies match up and to make the work match up. And so we get these invitations to do something and it's such a temptation because there might be some funds tied to it or there might be some promise of if, if we prove this research, then this will come. And that has never been the case with Stephanie. She has honored what we're already doing and the work that she's done so far in her research has already elevated what we're doing. In fact, two weeks from today, the entire team is meeting at Jacob's Heart. And it's our first formal conversation around what are we going to do to develop our program for survivorship? We've been tucking in lots of little things as we've learned along the way. There, there isn't one aspect of, of the learnings that she's found that we haven't found a way to elevate what we're already doing. And now the question is, what is the next level for us? How do we really transform our programming to meet the needs of families. But this has been over the course of years, trusting the information that she's getting and knowing that it's coming directly from our families in a linguistic and linguistically relevant and respectful way, really honoring the family's experiences. Um, just super important and cheerleader for all the CBOs out there trying to, trying to make it happen. And while we appreciate the curiosity and the, the willingness to step into our world and learn more and, and how to do it better. There's so much to be done um, when it comes to this relationship, making sure that it has long lasting effect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other, how are we doing on time? I might just, we could talk for hours yes. on these things. So I just wanna, you know, perfect, a little pulse check. I think we'll, we'll touch, you've already touched on what's worked well and some of the challenges. Um, I wanna make sure that we have time to talk a little bit more concretely about tips for researchers that are hoping to engage with community partners, knowing that many in our audience may be in partnerships already 
others may be just thinking about this idea of, of kind of weaving the ivory tower of academia and saying, how do we start to, to sort of get into the community and work with folks who, um, who have different backgrounds than ourselves and different trainings? I think some of the, um, some of the ideas that, that I think are really important and that we've already touched on is this idea of trust. Um, and how do you form trust? It doesn't happen in an instant, right? You can't walk up to someone and say, I trust you, or do you trust me? This is something that, that evolves over years, but I think to, to a certain extent, it's approaching these partnerships with that goal, that long-term goal of how do, we, um, how do we start to develop that through subtle actions and communication and, and this idea that as a researcher, we don't know many things. Um, and in fact, we don't know much of what our community partners um, are doing on a daily basis, the problems that they're seeing, the challenges that they see on a daily basis. So I think it is work, to me, it's approaching this work with, with a lot of humility um, about not knowing and, and being open to having this conversation to understand um, together what's the best way to ask a question, to answer a question, to start to tackle a problem. Um, so, so these are kind of some of, the, some of the key ideas, I think, are trust, it's open communication, um, having and agreeing upon shared goals. And sometimes that means compromising on someone's goal or saying that's really important and let's get to that or table that or think about that as an eventual step, but maybe we can align on an earlier goal together that's more reachable. Um, I think from an academic perspective, one of the things that I've, um, that I've learned is the need to be really flexible, thinking about working with our institutional review board, our IRB, and the ethics approvals that are necessary to get research outside of academia um, and partner with community organizations. And I think um, flexibility around timelines from a grant and funding um, perspective is also really important um, and necessary to allow us to sort of have this full partnership. Um, any tips that you would have, Heidi, for, for folks? You covered a lot of good ones. I'll just add on the flexibility side, the flexibility with the agency that you're working with. Um, for example, Steph had a, a session you know, set, RSVPs, and then it was canceled because the people that were coming, most of them canceled. And so it, remembering that from the academic perspective, that it's people with lots of different things going on in their own lives that are going to really dictate the success of something. And so staying open to that, both with the folks that you're trying to engage in the research and then the, the agency leading that. I think that's something that you've done really well is, is given our staff grace for how long it might take to do something. Um, we're very, very mindful and protective of how often we ask our families to participate in things, what we ask them to participate in. And so that means that the timeline might be a little bit longer than what you wanted. And it's just gone a long way. And the family's also building trust because at the end of the day, what you're looking for is, is anecdotal expression of someone's experience. And the only way to get that goes back to trust. And so one way to build that trust is to give the agency that you're working with the grace for what it might look like. And that means you have to communicate with them and understand how their agency really works. I think that, that you could probably write a grant on behalf of Jacob's Heart, you know our work that well. And that says a lot and goes a long way, not only with, with myself, but also our team, which then ripples into our family. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll, um, we'll probably wrap it up from here just to give our um, colleagues from Pride Night the chance to share their work as well. Um, but just want to thank our funding um, organizations and all of you for listening. Um, and we'll, we'll be happy to chat more in the Q&A as well. We don't go anywhere. And... Everyone, um, you can all hear me. Okay. Um, I'm Juno Obadin Um, I use she and her pronouns, and I'm going to say metrics and gynecology. And I get to work with amazing team members all the time. Um, and it's funny because my name is on some things, but like I by no means do the the bulk force of the work. And I'm hoping here today and hearing from my colleagues here to really like move forward the work so you can learn about how um, 
what we've done around uh, sexual and gender minority people um, and family building. Sexual and gender minority people, sexual and gender minority is a term that's often used in academia to represent what in the community people talk about as LGBTQI or lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, queer, transgender, intersex, uh, and asexual, sometimes allied, but we can hold that as asexual plus community members and family building, um, which has been really understudied, underserved, um, and really an exciting uh, area to, to start to bring into more of our next learning. Um, and I'll just say, as a uh, this is the culmination of a lot of personal and professional goals, and I'm just so um, tickled actually to be here in this moment, but it would not be possible without um, scholars and mostly community uh, relationships, which we'll hear about from uh, Danielle. I'm going to pass, I'm going to actually sit down and let them talk, and then we'll have a chance to Thank you. Let's start with you guys. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Diana Tordoff and I'm a postdoctoral scholar with the Pride Study and I use she, her pronouns. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Moretti. I am community engagement lead with PrideNet and I use all pronouns with positive intent. Um, so today um, we're gonna start with a little background and motivation um, for our current um, grant around family building. Um, we'll then provide an overview um, of um, our community listening sessions. Um, and then Daniel will give an overview of PrideNet and the activation of our community engagement network. Um, and lastly, we'll briefly touch on findings and some successes and challenges. Um, so we uh, are gonna be talking about this grant we received from MCHRI, really focused on sexual and gender minority family building. Um, just to give an overview of the scope of this grant, um, these first two aims really our quantitative aims, leveraging data from the PRIDE study, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, and then today we're really gonna focus on this third aim, which is a qualitative study uh, that was conducted in partnership with PRIDENET, which is our community engagement network. Um, and so this aim really focused on the family building experiences of sexual and gender minority folks who are assigned male at birth. So the PRIDE study, which stands for Population Research in Identities and Disparities for Equality, um, is a almost decade old study. Um, it was launched in 2015 um, as an iPhone app and then was relaunched in 2017 with an online platform. Um, and that was also the year where we began L um, longitudinal data collection. So the PRIDE study is really focused on what are the social, physical, and mental health um, outcomes of LGBTQIA people living across the U.S. Um, so our study includes um, all um, anyone who identifies as LGBTQIA um, and as an adult and lives in the U.S. and any of its territories. Um, and to date, we've enrolled um, over 29,000 participants. Um, our study is really uh, focused around an annual survey that's taken online, um, but we also have other mechanisms of engaging with community. So we have um, focused topics, cross-sectional studies um, that we can share with our Pride Study participants to really focus on more focused topics like family building and reproductive health, um, but we also hold community listening sessions relatively regularly. Um, and community listening sessions are essentially what research we think of as focus groups. Um, and the goal of these community listening sessions is to really um, remain connected to the priorities of the LGBTQI community and to also continually learn and improve the way that we do data collection. Um, so to date, we've done over 30 community listening sessions, both in person and online, with um, well over 300 participants. Um, I think I'm missing a slide. Yeah. It's okay. Um, so I did want to just provide um, a little bit of motivation for our current um, study. Um, so in 
2018, we added uh, new questions on parentage and family building to our annual questionnaire. Um, and then in 2019, the subsequent year, uh, we also launched a specific study focused on the family building experiences and reproductive health of um, LGBTQ folks who are assigned female at birth. So this includes sexual minority cisgender women, transgender men, and non-binary people who are assigned female at birth. Um, and we received both positive community feedback on this work, but we also heard pretty consistently from sexual minority cis men, as well as transgender women, that they also wanted to tell their stories about their families and their family building experiences. Um, great, no worries. Um, so we heard this through a couple of different mechanisms. We heard it directly from our participants. Uh, we heard it sort of as we were publishing and as we are also presenting the results of our research. Um, at different conferences. Um, and so hearing this gap in our work from participants also really aligned with the gap in the research. There's extremely limited information on how sexual minority people who are assigned male at birth build their families and create their families. Um, so in 2021, we applied to a grant um, with MCHRI, um, which led to the funding of our current community listening sessions. Um, so we conducted 10 community listening sessions in uh, 2022 to 2023. Um, and these sessions were um, really focused on the family building experiences of individuals who are assigned male at birth. We included both current parents, as well as people who desired to be parents or had maybe started their family building journey, but who were not yet, um, did not yet have children. Um, and we also um, let folks um, participate based on um, the, sort of which gender category they best aligned with. So we had folks who are cisgender sexual minority men, we had trans feminine folks um, and transgender women. Um, and then we also included non-binary and gender diverse people assigned male at birth. Um, and lastly, we piloted this as an asynchronous focus group format which is a really fancy way of saying an online messaging board. <laughs> um, so we had this, uh, basically this online messaging board system that was you know, HIPAA compliant and private to our participants. Um, and participants could log in over a four day period to respond to our questions um, and then to also comment on each other's posts. Um, and the reason why we chose this format is we thought this would be more flexible and accessible, especially for parents who are busy and caring for kids of potentially all ages. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel, who's gonna really talk about how we engaged our network. Great, thanks so much, Diana. So um, as Diana mentioned, I'm gonna take a little bit of a step backwards and give an overview of what PrideNet is, what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. And this is to give an example of ways to work with a community engagement network when it comes to health research. Um, so overarchingly, Pride, uh, PrideNet is a community engagement network that focuses on catalyzing LGBTQIA health research. And the ways that we do that is that we create opportunities to connect LGBTQIA people with opportunities to participate in trusted health research. But really importantly, the reason why we do this is to address the gap in data about the health of LGBTQIA community members. Really importantly to our work is that we also make sure to um, uh, have community input from the LGBTQIA community inform all phases of the research process. So I know that we probably all are familiar with the research that maybe parachutes in and out with data collection and um, nothing to be heard for the community after the reports are done and after the collection is done, we really wanted to do things differently. So you'll see in this graphic that we really want community input to inform everything from the design of the research, how the questions are being asked, what's being asked, through to implementation, data collection, but all the way through to dissemination of the findings. So bringing the research findings back to the community in ways that could benefit them and that are supportive for them as well. Um, in building a community engagement network, 
being very clear and transparent about what our values are was incredibly important. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about the four pillars of our core values. So first is focused on building give and take relationships. So essentially we wanna create mutually beneficial collaborations so that all of our collaborators are also benefiting from being part of this community engagement network. The second is really recognizing complex identities and communities. We know that the LGBTQI plus community is not a monolith and we need to make sure that we honor and respect the multiple intersecting identities that our communities and our partners hold. The, la uh, sorry, the third is around creating equity. So we strive to create equity because we understand that we should not take a one size fits all approach to community engagement and instead should look at how we could customize or tailor our collaborations so that it works best for each organization and stakeholder we're working with. And lastly, we strive to create transparency. So this is both transparency about the research that's being done, but also transparency about our practices, the work that we're doing for community engagement, what we're doing and why we're doing it. I wanted to give a snapshot of who are the different groups and the main activities when it comes to PrideNet's network, but also in terms of, in, in, in particular, when it comes to getting community input. So I'll talk about each of these groups individually as well, but we have, when it comes to the main groups that we're working with, we have our participant advisory committee, our ambassadors, our community partner consortium. When it comes to some of the core activities and that's relevant for this particular project, we also do a lot of digital engagement as well as community listening sessions. And I think the important takeaway here is that we really intentionally are creating a feedback loop so that there's mechanisms in place for community input to come in and form our practices, as well as partnerships in place when it comes to sending back out resources, information, opportunities to participate in research that's coming through trusted messengers. So to talk briefly about each of the groups, stakeholders and the, the groups that we're working with, we have our participant advisory committee that's very much like a community advisory board. These individuals are very diverse when it comes to their lived experience, their professional experience, and also the different demographics and geographic locations they are at. Um, this group provides input on both community engagement practices and research practices. Um, they meet once a month with us in between projects, uh, in between meetings, they can opt in to support particular projects and they also receive honorarium. The next group is our ambassadors. These are really community influencers, community um, leaders. And again, just like the participant advisory committee, they represent a variety of diverse identities and geographic locations. And their main focus is around providing input on community engagement, but also doing local community engagement activities within the communities that they're embedded within. Very similarly, they meet with us once a month, they do activities in between meetings, and they also receive an honorarium. Our community partner consortium, that consists of uh, now over 30 organizations that really span a, a variety of different backgrounds. They're LGBTQI plus health organizations, uh, healthcare providers, community organizations, grassroots. We have organizations that are national, regional, local, and again, spanning across the geographic um, realm throughout the US. And really the work that the Community Partner Consortium is doing is engaging the patients, the communities, the stakeholders that they're a part of around PrideNet activities. And we're very much often collaborating so that we can also amplify the work that these organizations are doing as well and finding ways that we have shared interest in projects and collaborations. So oftentimes PrideNet is helping to provide funding when it comes to shared activities that we're doing together. One thing I did wanna mention that doing this type of intentional, meaningful, sustained relationship building is something that takes a lot of time and effort. And the network is not something that's created overnight. So for many of these organizations that you'll see up here, we've been working with them since 2015. So now almost a decade together. And we really importantly want to create opportunities so that they see value in this collaboration. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about what, what partners, what our collaborators see in terms of why they wanna partner with PrideNet. So really it's around working towards the shared goal. So really it's about LGBTQI plus representation, 
whether it be in health research or other areas as well. And all together as well, we're working towards more culturally competent and responsive care for LGBTQI plus communities. We also have shared values in the way that we do our work. That's why it's really important for us to be transparent and upfront about what our values are. And then partners also see that collaboration as part of a national network is really valuable. So we've seen collaborations with different organizations, with the Participant Advisory Committee and ambassadors within and beyond Pride Net. And one example of how we also foster this, later this month, we're bringing all of our network together to Stanford's campus to do a Pride Net Summit. So it's really an opportunity for folks to connect, build collaborations, and importantly, we're doing professional development and capacity building with them. So now that I've talked about what PrideNet is, I wanna share a little bit more about how we activated our network for this particular project. So as Diana mentioned, we had three distinct groups that we were really focused on hearing from, cisgender sexual minority men, transgender women, and non-binary people assigned male at birth. And we knew that we could not take a one-size-fits-all approach to engagement and to promotion. So we tailored specific messages and particular images that spoke to each of these individual communities individually and also collectively. So we knew that individuals had to see themselves represented in the materials to know we wanted to hear from them specifically. That was really important that their voices are heard. So we created these materials. We created um, uh, some toolkits key language so that our network, we can activate our network to share it across their communities and um, their communications channels. So we activated our participant advisory committee, ambassadors sharing in social networks, but also our community partner consortium, as you can see here, just one example, Helen Lord, they're an LGBTQI plus health provider organization in New York. They help to share across their social media. We heard in our registration that many organizations, sorry, many of the individuals heard about this opportunity through our networks. We also saw the opportunity to engage organizations that were not yet in our network, but that were focusing at the intersection of LGBTQIA plus family building. So that included organizations like Men Having Babies, Family Equality, and Our Family Coalition. So together, these groups were really key and instrumental in getting participants to the community listening session and really um, poised to be engaged and share their feedback. So I'll pass it back to Diana to share more about the findings. Wonderful. Um, so I just wanted to briefly touch on our findings. Um, so the ultimate goal is for these findings to inform how we ask questions on future surveys and also to develop, as we did for people assigned female at birth, potentially a survey that's really specific to the family building journey of individuals who are assigned male at birth. Um, so overall, we were able to reach 52 participants um, who ranged in age from uh, 19 to 71 years old. Um, we were able to reach more non-parents than parents, um, and we were able to um, reach all three gender groups relatively equally. Um, and notably, our participants were diverse in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, here we're showing demographics um, such that participants could select more than one race and ethnicity, ethnicity um, and over 50% of our participants selected at least one non-white race. Um, so some of the overarching themes that came out of these focus groups um, included the desire for and possibility of parenthood, uh, factors that influence the family building journey, including which specific method individuals use to build their families, um, people's experiences raising children, and of course, the role of healthcare providers. Um, so participants talked a lot about how the family they were raised in, parenting role models, and their prior experiences with children really influenced their desire to be parents. Um, participants also talked about how their sexual and gender minority identity influenced how they felt if becoming a parent or having children was possible or achievable. Um, so here are two quotes from participants. Um, one cisgender man is sharing how um, coming of age during the age during the AIDS crisis of the 1990s made it feel really hard or impossible um, to become a parent, um, especially feeling at the time, like as a gay man, that he would not live a long life. Um, and another trans woman participant really shared 
um, that she spends lots of her most of her time in LGBTQIA spaces, um, and that in her experience, conversations about parenting just don't happen in these spaces, um, and that this often made her feel alone or like it was less likely that she would be able to become a parent. Uh, participants also talked about a wide range of factors that influence family building, including age, financial and cost considerations, the desire for biological children, uh, legal factors and experiences of discrimination or fear of experiencing discrimination, um, social support from partners and family, racial and ethnic considerations, um, as well as experiences of gender dysphoria, which really describes a feeling of unease or discomfort or dissatisfaction with the gender's aspects of one's, one person's identity or body. Um, so one trans woman participant, actually several trans women talked about their experiences accessing fertility services. Um, and this one participant really shared about how her and her wife were forced to try and conceive doing sex through sexual intercourse, which was really uncomfortable for her and really triggering of her dysphoria. Um, but that this was required in order to prove infertility to their insurance company in order to get coverage. Um, and so she specifically described this process as heartbreaking. Um, and on the other hand, she also shared about how when her child came into the world, um, all she felt was joy. Um, and even through these hard experiences, it really felt worth it. Um, and then lastly, uh, I wanted to briefly touch on the role of healthcare providers. Uh, participants described a really wide range of uh, interactions with providers. Um, some described really positive, affirming interactions. Others described a complete omission of discussion with providers because they assumed their providers didn't think they were interested in becoming parents. Um, and then some participants described negative experiences, experiences of discrimination, or experiences um, of interacting with providers who are not LGBTQ competent. Um, and so just to highlight this one quote by a trans woman participant um, who said that uh, many of the clinics she went to to access fertility services said that they were LGBTQ inclusive, but that they really only had experience working with cisgender, gay, and lesbian couples um, and really lacked um, trans competencies and did not have familiarity with how to serve or work with trans families. All right, back to Daniel. Yeah, thanks so much. So in closing, we're just going to share some of the uh, successes and challenges. So starting with successes is that we felt like we created a dynamic space where participants were engaged and what they shared really challenged and nuanced some of the traditional considerations or notions when we think of what is a parent or parenthood. So for example, we heard a lot of themes around chosen family and chosen family as it relates specifically to parent and child relationships. Um, we also um, heard from participants that they shared that they had a meaningful experience participating in the sessions and that they were connected to resources. Something we noticed early on was that a lot of participants were asking for resources when it came to family building. And we had worked with all of these partners that had such great resources. So we aggregated all the resources, created a guide, and from there on, we shared it with all the participants afterwards. Um, and then we were able to establish new relationships with organizations. So some of the new organizations that we reached out to, because we have this ongoing network, they were interested in joining. So we're in the process of some of those partners being part of the ongoing Pride Net network as well. And then lastly, as Diana mentioned, this was a good opportunity for us to pilot asynchronous digital technology. Um, for challenges, one area was that we were doing really focused recruitment and that was incredibly time intensive. This was both because we're working with very specific sub communities, but also we saw a very high volume of scammers and bots. And we took very meticulous measures to make sure that we protected the integrity of the study. Um, we also had difficulty reaching particular sub communities. And this in particular were non-binary parents and transgender parents. So some of the ways that we tried to address that was through snowball sampling. So some of the folks that were part of these communities that earlier participated in the listening sessions we, we, um, that uh, were interested in it, they helped to recruit for, from the communities that they're a part of and that they were also provided an incentive and compensation for doing so. 
And lastly, we were balancing the multiple aspects of representation. So we had to think about both demographics and identities, but also importantly, what were the method or methods of family building that were either used or being pursued? So in closing, just wanted to share if the things that we talked about were of interest, um, follow us on social media. Um, we have a QR code for our newsletter, um, a kind of low key and quiet. We anticipate having a manuscript about Pride Nets community engagement work that will be coming out later very soon. Um, <laughs> zip, um, very soon. So if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get the first info when that's available. But thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate thank the opportunity. You. Well, thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Like, I learned a lot from this presentation, like how powerful of a wonderful um, Ownership and also like our community engagement, like play such an impact for the community. So now we definitely got some questions to online as well. So I before that I would like to insert, like invite our uh, speaker come um come to the front and then we can start to yeah ask uh respond to the question. Yeah, the first question is like for the gift and case relationship. Or other participants, uh, participants most interested in why do they participate? Mm -hmm. I think we're just repeat that. Right? Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> we're all passing the mic. Yeah. So I think in terms of, and if I'm understanding, oh, sorry, if I'm understanding correctly, I feel very like I'm on TikTok. Um, <laughs> if I'm understanding correctly, the questions around what were the motivations for participants to join? So um, I think the quote that, we, that was on the slide that we didn't get to share in depth was one individual shared, which we heard the sentiment multiple times, was that there's not a lot of spaces that they felt in the LGBTQ community to connect with others who are either parents or looking to be parents. So they said that to have that safe space to discuss, but also to learn from each other's experience, that that was really rewarding. Um, and I think the connection to resources um, was very rewarding. And some people, let's be honest, also said that the gift card that we provided as an incentive was also a big motivation as well, so. Yeah, several other participants shared um, that when they were on their family building journey, they really struggled to find resources and information. Um, and so contributing to the future availability of research and resources was a big motivation for them as well. Thank you. And then
as make a chart indicating that we're making. So taking taking the fact finding and, and asking those questions, as I mentioned earlier. But then for me, with the different coalitions that I'm a part of, taking those findings to those coalitions so that other leaders in small community-based organizations can maybe start asking similar questions. You know, are you are we really listening to families? Are we staying tethered for us? Our biggest takeaway, if I had to like say the biggest thing, is that it's our responsibility when we say yes to a family that we're staying tethered to them as long as we possibly can, because the 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 path is very unique. And so the trigger might be 10 years later. And so have we established a pipeline of communication? Um, and so making sure that families know that. And I could share, um, in terms of PrideNet, what our routine practice is, is that we create community-friendly summaries of all the research findings. So when a manuscript is published, this is really using accessible language, grade 12 or below reading level. And we create these summaries really kind of highlighting what are the key findings, what was done that was different. We share that out through our email chains directly to the participants as well as through social media. We also create infographics, so that is a visual way to share back the findings. One other practice that we're starting to um, experiment with, just the other weekend, we also did kind of like a town hall where we shared the findings um, virtually around um, another community listening session project that we did in collaboration with a partner. And we got a lot of great feedback that people appreciated that opportunity to kind of maybe talk with someone, mm -hmm. um, have that conversation. So just trying to provide multiple different options when it comes to returning back to findings and participants. All right, so. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, no worry. Yeah, thank you. I think that's all just like great sharing. So yeah, we will have a more, one more question in person. So from my experience in research, I was rather um, working with population-based samples, so much more like much broader. And from my experience, sometimes it's hard to retain participants because like they have other things to do. And I was wondering from your experience, like because you work with very specific subsample sub and you have so much care into adapt to the needs and maybe also they feel heard. So I was wondering if you think that it's easier to retain or I don't know, um, get involved with these participants because it's much more tailored than road approaches. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think you're getting to the point of really complexity that you know what it is for many folks who are participants like tied to an identity and it's something that's you know personal to them. I think there's that added dimension, but I do think we do also, you know, face some of the challenges when it comes to common challenges when it comes to retention. Some people, when speaking about the price of the participants, some people that will sign up, they'll be very active for a year, and then we don't hear from them, you know, there's kind of a pause. Um, so there's a lot, we have a participant engagement director that really is focusing, you know, on that relationship building where, you know, I think definitely having this network and having this, you know, approach is helpful, but we do face a lot of those challenges as well. I don't know if there's yeah. Yeah. Well, jump in here to say, it's such a good question. I also think that there's like, need for many, many types of research, right? So um, we partner with a, a big research, another big research called West Virginia program, um, which, which their goal is to recruit uh, at least 10 million uh, folks who are living in the United States, um, funded by the Precision Medicine Initiative and the NIH. Um, but they're, you know, that's, it's not population-based, but it's we, um, and they kind of marry, they take in a different approach than other large type cohort studies, which is community engagement. So we do community engagement for less people there. But I'll just say it's a very different experience in that it's much further at arm's length than what we do with Pride Study or then what we do with community listening sessions. So each of those are sort of concentric circles of how engaged we are with participants. And they allow us to do different things. Like there's no way that we could that kind of very tailored, very relationally based approach that we do with our community listening sessions, or even in the pride study with all of us, we're still kind of trying to infuse some of those things. On the flip side, with all of us, we're able to look at you know, they do whole genome sequencing, they're, they're mapping EMRs, and so 
they can answer a question and the reason would be So the the need is there for multiplicity, I think, to describe people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great um, information everybody sharing. Like, any other questions? I do have some questions. <laughs> like, you know, one asks, I will catch yeah. this. Yeah, because I'm really interested. I can see like all this amazing community engagement, like the partnership you are uh, building and then forming. And like, have you ever have an experience or like some thought about like bringing this into our house policy things? Like any challenge you can see or like any the next step you are thinking? I know policy usually is hard. So, so we have actually had a number of our papers now cited um, study, um, in various policy briefs. I think Thank you. Yeah, I think that's another way regarding the uh, data dissemination, right? How we want to use the data only not publication, like you say, our our data points for people who are advocate for a bigger change system or policy change. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, let me see about on check. Yeah, if not, like we would like to wrap up the presentation today. Thank you, all the presenters coming over. I know like Heidi and everyone is trying kind of like far away to here. And thank you so much for making it and putting together such a wonderful presentation. Yeah, and then I would like to share like the uh, presentation has been recorded, so we'll be shared on our website so well more people can like you know go, go back and check it out. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you.